lifestyle, the way in which we live our lives. It's something formed throughout a series of decisions, whether intentional or accidental. But if our lives are to reflect the lifestyle of Jesus, it should be built with care. And as we allow God himself to form what he will in us and through us and around us, our lives are soon collected in a beautiful compilation for God's glory and for our good. Welcome everybody to the weekend and to the continuance of our sermon series in the Gospel of John. We're coming to the end and in this last season, we're talking about how Jesus can live out his life through you and me. Another way to put it is, how do you live the Jesus lifestyle? And we've been looking at different aspects of that. And this weekend, we're going to talk about prayer. And in particular, I want to talk to you about something we don't talk to God enough about. In fact, I want to make you a promise that if you'll take to heart this one very important prayer request that you and I should make to God every day of our lives, it is going to change your life. So turn with me to John chapter 17 and get ready for some radical and exciting changes that God wants to bring into your life. John chapter 17, here we go. Jesus is sharing with us here what is referred to as his high priestly prayer. It's a very intimate prayer that we're allowed to listen to and we learn what it is we should ask God for by hearing what Jesus says. It says, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Now this happens right after the upper room scene where Jesus celebrates Passover with his disciples and tells them he's about to suffer and die and before his arrest in the garden. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one that you've given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one that you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Now, you're included in that prayer right there in that verse. You and I are included in the prayer. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. John 17, 1 through 5 and verse 20 and verse 24. And I encourage you to take some time later today uh, to read that entire prayer that our Lord gave. But there's a nugget in here. There's something very precious in here that God wants you and I to learn to pray about just as he modeled for us in this prayer that we are looking at today. So let's explore this a little bit. What do you think Jesus meant when he prayed and said to his father, the hour has now come? Well, if you look at the Gospel of John that we've been studying, you'll find out that when John refers to the hour, that that has to do with Jesus' suffering, his impending death and crucifixion, his resurrection, and our celebration of eternal life. The hour comprises then this whole montage of our Lord's suffering for you and for me. And Jesus says, Father, the hour is, is coming. And I'm going to glorify you in this hour through my suffering, 
And I pray that you will then glorify me as well. Now that's a prayer that uh, we oftentimes don't pray ourselves, right? I mean, when you and I pray, we're not thinking about praying that God would use our life as a sacrifice or our suffering uh, for a purpose of bringing hope to others. Usually when we pray, we talk to God about our needs, our concerns, our wants, or our hurts. And that's legitimate because the Bible invites us, God invites us to talk to him about the things that are concerning us, our problems and our, and our issues. There's nothing wrong with that. But I wonder when the last time was that you and I were really raw and honest with God and we're willing to pray something like this, Father, I'm ready for you to use my life as a sacrifice so that others may come to know you and glorify you. That's just one of those prayers that uh, we don't pray very often and we prefer not to pray because you know, our whole focus is on preservation. It's not necessarily on this whole idea of sacrifice. Our bent is to try to get God to conform to our agenda or the agenda that we have for our kids or for our family or for our friends or our church or even for our nation for this world. But you know, when you look at this prayer of Jesus, which I hope you'll read carefully, he is not asking the Father to conform to his agenda. Rather, he's conforming his life to the Father's agenda, to what God's will is. Remember that scene in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is struggling with the crucifixion that's coming, the suffering that he's going to go through. And he says, if there's another way, if there's another way for redemption, if there's another way to, to save the world outside of the cross, he says, you know, then let this cup pass from me. But, he says, nevertheless, Father, not my will, not my agenda, but your will and your agenda be accomplished. Can you pray that way today? Can you pray and say, God, not my will, but your will be accomplished in my cancer. Your will, God, you be glorified in my loss. Father, you be glorified in my loneliness. Or the positive end, Father, you be glorified in my career. God, you be glorified in my successes. You be glorified in my talents, in my gifts, in my wealth, in every aspect of our lives, both the valleys and the mountains, right? The difficult times and the good times. Can we pray and say, Father, I ultimately want you to be glorified. This is not about me. This is not about my agenda. But God, this is about you. Tim Keller wrote a book on prayer, simply called Prayer. And he says this, I think it's remarkable. He says, our problem is that we often pray to get things from God or get him to give us things when what we should be praying is to find God in the things, to find God in the things. So that, as we've already said, whether I'm going through challenges or whether I'm going through successes, I'm always trying to find some way, some, somehow, to bring glory to God. That's what Jesus did his entire life. It was all about, God, how can I glorify you in this moment? And perhaps right now in your life, you're just going through something very challenging. And you're wondering to yourself, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? Or why am I going through this again? And I just want gently and, and kindly to encourage you. And instead of asking that question, why, which we all ask, been there, done that, I'm sure I'll be there and do that again. But if we could just discipline ourselves and say, God, I, I want to ask you these questions, why, but, but God, ultimately, what? What is, it, what is it you want to reveal to me? What is it you want to reveal to others about yourself 
as you journey with me through this particular valley that I'm experiencing right now. And like I said, even, even in the successes of life, even the victories of life, to keep ourselves from entering into pride, be able to say, Father, you have blessed me so much in this moment, in this situation. God, what is the glory that you want to bring to yourself? What is the glory you want to reveal to me about, about the blessing that you've brought my way? What's the, what's the glory you want to reveal to others about the blessing that you have brought my way? That's just an entirely different way of looking and thinking about things, isn't it? But you know something? Not only did Jesus pray and say, Father, in my sufferings, I want to glorify you. I want your glory to be seen. But do you realize that in his sufferings, Jesus was also praying for you and for me? He was praying that somehow in his sufferings, you and I would come to realize the glory of God's love for you and for me. That we would become aware of how much God cares for us, how obsessed he is with our lives and a restoration of our lives with himself. There's a passage of scripture that is a beautiful picture of this desire of our Lord to to make known in us the joy of God, the love and the glory and the presence of God. And it's a passage we oftentimes misunderstand. It's found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. In that passage, Jesus says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Now, normally when people look at that verse or interpret that verse, they think of Jesus standing outside of an unbeliever's life. And he's kind of knocking on their life saying, you know, would you let me into your life? But that's not the context. If you read the context carefully, it's Jesus standing outside the door of his church. It's Jesus standing outside the door of the believer's heart and knocking on your heart and my heart saying, I, I want to come in. I want to have intimate fellowship with you. I want to reveal within you the glory of my my Father's love and my Father's presence. I want that to overwhelm you. I want to invite you into that relationship. Isn't that beautiful? And the question I, I have for you and that I have for myself is, are we living? Are we living in that fellowship? Are we living in that intimacy? Are we living with that sense that God is fully alive in our lives? Because this is the aim toward, toward which this prayer is moving us. That just as Jesus prayed, Father, reveal your glory in me. I want to challenge you to begin thinking about praying and asking God every day, Father, reveal to me your glory in me. Father, reveal to the world around me, to the friends around me, my loved ones, the strangers around me, reveal your glory, your presence in me and through me. I mean, when is the last time you and I prayed something like that? Do you know the glory of God's presence in you? You know, there is a prayer request that Moses once made to God, literally on, on the mountaintop. And he said to God, he said, show me your glory. Show me your, your presence and it's found in uh, Exodus chapter 33. What's interesting about this passage of Scripture is that it's sandwiched between chapter 32 and chapter 34, which are really unique incidences that take place. And 33, where he asks for God to reveal his glory, almost seems kind of out of place. You see, in Exodus chapter 32, we have the uh, situation of the golden calf. Moses had gone up Mount Sinai to be with God, and he was gone, I guess the people thought, for a little too long. They wondered where this guy had gone to, and so they come to Aaron, and they say to Aaron, um, you know, we don't know where Moses is. 
we want you to fashion some kind of idol for us to worship. And so Aaron foolishly goes along with them. He calls them to bring some of their gold. He melts the gold down, creates this golden calf. And everybody says, there, that's the God that led us out of Egypt. And like pagans, they begin to revel and they begin to worship this golden calf as the God that brought them out. And well, God is giving Moses the Ten Commandments and writing it on that, those stone tablets that Moses cut out, he informs Moses that those people that you led out of Egypt are in rebellion. And God's about ready to destroy them. And he's about ready to start all over again just with Moses. And Moses is pleading with God, you know, don't destroy these people. What will people say about you? You let them out of Egypt only to destroy their lives. Moses comes down to see what's going on. He is so upset about it that he takes those tablets and he smashes them to the ground. And you can read chapter 32 and see what happens after that. But then if we skip ahead to chapter 34, Moses is pleading with God. And he's saying to God, God, listen, um, don't send me with your people and you stay behind. <laughs> if you don't go with us, I'm not going. We have to have your presence or we're not going to make it. And so in that passage there in 34, God reveals his mercies to Moses. He relents and agrees that he will go with Moses and go with the people. It is in between those two things that Moses says to God, show me your presence. I want to see your glory. Now, why does he do that? Well, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, uh, who was the chief rabbi of, of England, he's passed away now, has a really interesting commentary on this passage of Scripture, which I find very insightful and very helpful. He says, you know, there was a, an experience in Israel that was taking place where, where Israel was feeling kind of remote from God. I mean, their leader is up on the mountain with God. And their whole view of God is, is one of God's greatness and, and one kind of of, you know, God's terrifying presence, right? I mean, they've experienced God's plagues on Egypt, one right after the other. They have seen God's presence come down on Mount Sinai with peals of, of thunder and lightning. And they've been told, don't even come to the base. Don't get near the mountain or you'll die. They've experienced Moses going into what was called the tent of the meeting outside their camp, not in their camp, but quite a ways outside of the camp and watching as Moses goes in and God's presence comes down. And it just feels like God is far from them. And what Jonathan Sachs in essence is saying is that what Moses is expressing to God is, God, your people, right now they don't need to simply see your greatness, they need to know your closeness. And it's as though Moses is wondering to himself, can the God who created this world, can the God who is so great, so powerful, so terrifying at times, can, can he also be near? Can he also be close? God, can you, can you show me your glory? If you read that passage of Scripture, it says that God tells Moses, I can't let you see my face. It'll overwhelm me. It'll kill you. My glory is so great. I mean, think about like staring into the sun. If you stare in the sun, you'll go blind. So God says, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. And it says that God placed his hand there, and God caused his presence to move past Moses, and then God removes his hand, and Moses sees the perimeter of God, the outskirts of God, and the glory of God. And he realizes that, that God is holy, and God cannot be compromised, but that God does desire to come close. In fact, if you go back and read the scriptures, you'll see that God has always had the desire to dwell with his creation in the, in the Garden of Eden. God was there with Adam and Eve. It was Adam and Eve who pulled and moved away from God, 
who sinned against God, who rebelled against God, and forced the separation. And from that moment on, God has been pursuing to come close to us. First in the tabernacle, then in the temple. And then God became flesh through his son Jesus and, and walked amongst humanity and then died and rose again. And now in these days, listen, we've been talking about this the last couple of weekends. He's now come to actually indwell us with his presence, the Holy Spirit living in us, in you, and in me. So when we talk about praying and asking God to reveal his glory to us, don't think about it as God's glory way out there someplace in this big you know, spotlight that's just all of a sudden going to come shining on you. What does it mean when you and I pray for the glory of God? It means for us to not only recognize God out there, but recognize God's presence in here, in you, and in me. You know, oftentimes we think about the sunrise, the sunset, or mountains, or the ocean, or the beach, or some beautiful scene in nature, the, the moon, or the, or the stars in the sky. We, we associate that with the glory of God, and certainly the heavens declare, David says, the glory of God. But listen to me. The glory of God also dwells in you. And me, if we are indeed truly followers of Christ. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, so all of us who have had that veil removed, you know, Christ removed the veil, right? He died. He removed the separation that exists between us and God. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Now, this word reflect literally means to gaze, it's not a very good translation here, but it means to gaze. We can see and gaze at the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us, watch, more and more like him. So there's this progression. In my, in my life, I should become I should be becoming more and more like Christ. More and more of his glory should be seen in me. Makes us more and more like him as we are changed. What does he say? Into his glorious image. We are created, remember, in the image and likeness of God. And that was marred by sin. And Christ has come back to restore in us, so to speak, the image of God. What Paul's saying is if you, if you want to know the glorious image of God living in you, if you want to experience that glory, you got to gaze. you got to take time. You've got to take time to look at Jesus. I'm not talking about an abstract kind of view of God. I'm talking about seeing Jesus in the story of the gospel, in the story of salvation. In fact, if you read, again, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, inherent in that passage is the story of salvation. It is Jesus giving up his place in glory, taking on human flesh, Revealing the glory of God's love and grace by dying for us. Rising again from the dead. And imputing his spirit into our, into our lives. That's what we're to stare at. That's what we're to gaze at. That's what we are to be overwhelmed and amazed by. Not just this information in our mind that we've studied in a Bible study or went to seminary to discover but to live in the overwhelming awareness that God would do that for me. So let me ask you a question. What are you gazing at these days? 
Look at this. You will be transformed into the likeness of whoever or whatever is most important to you. Why don't you think about that for a minute? Whatever you are gazing at, whatever is drawing your attention to, is what's going to influence you, is what's going to transform you. And some of us right now are not being transformed by the weight of God's glory in our lives. We're being transformed by the weight of our problems. Whether it's our sickness, our pain, our loss, our loneliness. Some of us are being transformed by the weight of politics in our world. Some of us are being transformed by the weight of a pandemic or by the weight of the economy or by the weight of relational problems and issues in our world. We're being transformed by the weight of social media. What is it you've been gazing at? What is it that occupies your greatest attention? Is it your job? Is it your, your relational problems? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? I understand that all those things may play importance in our lives, but if they have and hold our gaze, they're transforming us and they're transforming us into something pretty ugly. We got to get our gaze fixed on Christ. Look what Paul writes in another passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine where? In our hearts. To give us the light of the knowledge, here we go again, of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That's such a rich passage. Like Moses, God, show me your glory. And, and you know when we say, show me your glory, the first place we ought to go to look and see God's glory is in the mirror. Is in the mirror. Because listen to this. He, Christ, lost his glory so we, so you and I, could have his honor. I was reading about a Christian artist, Lecrae. Maybe you know him. He's a Christian rapper, does film. He does a lot of things. Follower of Christ. And, uh, he was sharing how he was going to go appear at a conference several years ago in California. And on his way, he stopped in a department store just to buy a T-shirt. All he wanted to do was buy a cotton T-shirt. So he pulls this T-shirt out of the rack, and it says $640. And he thinks to himself, this has got to be a mistake. You know, they, they somehow got the price messed up on here. So he pulls another one out. And it's the same thing, $640. And it's just a plain T-shirt. So he goes up to the counter to the salesperson. He says, I, I, I think there's got to be a mistake here. I mean, how can a T-shirt, I just want a T-shirt cost $640. I mean, I mean, do I put it on and, and, and do I suddenly have superpowers? <laughs> I mean, how could this be $640? And the salesperson looked at him and said, it's all about the designer's name that is on the shirt. It's the designer's name that gives it its value. And Lecrae went to that concert that he was going to appear at, and he shared with the people, and he said, here's what happened to me today. I went to buy a T-shirt that I didn't think was worth much, and I found out it was worth $640 because of whose name was on it. And he said to the audience, and I, and, I will, and I want to say this to you and me right now, whether you're watching me online or at one of our campuses or our venues, whose name is on you? Because if you're a follower of Christ, no price can be placed on you. You are so valuable. You are so worthy because the glory of God, the name of Jesus, has been written across your life, has been written across your heart. 
you have no idea of how valuable and how worthy you are to him that he would place his presence in your life. When I was thinking about that, I remembered a sermon I heard many years ago by an African-American pastor, E.V. Hill. (laughs) And what a sermon. What a sermon. In fact, I listened to it again. And in the message, he asked this question, when was God at his greatest? In fact, you might want to YouTube it and listen to it yourself. It's powerful. When was God at his greatest by E.V. Hill? And he goes through this, this, this whole long narrative. You know, was God at his greatest when he created the worlds? Was God at his greatest when he made the moon and the stars? Was God at his greatest when he created Adam and Eve? Was God at his greatest when he let the people out of slavery in Egypt? Was God at his greatest when he became human flesh and dwelt among us? Was God at his greatest on the cross? Was God at his greatest at the resurrection. And every time he asks the question, he'll go, no. And he builds this momentum, right? And you begin to wonder, I mean, if, if he wasn't at his greatest on the cross or at the resurrection, when was he his greatest? And then Evie Hill talks about how at 11 years of age, walking on an old dirt road, God met him. And as he says, And God got all over me and saved me. And I went home and I told my mama that Jesus had saved me. And she looked at me and she said, I can tell that Jesus has saved you. And Evie Hill asked, when was God at his greatest? When he saved that 11-year-old boy. When was God at his greatest in your life and my life? When he reached down and showed us his love and his mercy and knocked at the door of our hearts and said, I want to come in and reveal my glory to you, in you, and through you. You see, that's the greatest prayer you can ever pray. That's the prayer you ought to pray every day. God, reveal your glory in me, to me, and to others, through me, and through others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just ask that you would teach us how to see your glory in our lives. Father, just saying that is so humbling. It's so incredible, almost hard to believe that you would want to live in me, in us. We are so sinful. We are so unworthy, so undeserving, oh God. It is overwhelming. It knocks us. It should knock us off our feet as we gaze at our lives and realize what you've done for us. And Father, as we realize what you've done for others, Lord, that we would see and know your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you'd like to learn more about living a life of prayer, focusing on God, just go to prayer at wooddale.org, prayer at wooddale.org. Take a look at that page. We have such great, helpful resources to deepen your prayer life and to bring you into that closer relationship with God. Because prayer, listen, prayer is the best way for you to discover the glory of his presence living in you. We'll see you next weekend.